family. Our guest today is Dr. Chris Ford. I just love calling him Dr. Chris, although I know him personally and we've been friends for so many years. I love that this guy is really brilliant and so down to earth. Let me read some stuff about him to you because honestly, some of the stuff he does, I can't even say it without reading it. Here we go. Dr. J. Chris Ford is an experienced serial entrepreneur, researcher, and expert in building inclusive, innovative ecosystems and programs for intellectual property. He's done this with federal agencies, universities, corporations, and investors, and currently is the principal scientist and research faculty at Florida International University, as well as the University of Houston. Now, Dr. Ford is also CEO of M2M Ventures. This is a firm that specializes in patent monetization, and he's going to talk about how you can um, actually sign up with him to take advantage of some of that. You see, he was a technical and technology transfer advisor for the U.S. Department of Energy when I met him, and he's done over 20,000 patents with a present value of $77 billion engaged in monetization. He's also assessed and aided more than 40 ventures with a uh, technology transfer and commercialization pro uh, projects for the DOE. He's really a brilliant guy. He's a very faith-based person and he has been serving as a policy volunteer on the Biden-Harris campaign. He's worked in both administrations um, with uh, President Trump and Biden coming in. You're gonna love listening and learning from him. He received his BS, MS, and PhD in mechanical engineering from Georgia Tech. He got his BS in mathematics and a dual degree in engineering from Morehouse. So he's all educated up, but importantly, he's also one of the best, most wonderful humanitarians I've met. He's also one of the greatest humanitarians I've met. And I'm really excited to have them here with us. Joining us right now is one of America's most successful female entrepreneurs. Special guest speaker today, the first African-American woman to own a billion dollar company. Her name is Janice Bryant Howroyd. She's the founder and CEO of Act One is one of the largest staffing companies in the United States. She's now ranked by Forbes as second wealthiest self-made African-American woman in America behind only Ms. Oprah Winfrey. And she spent almost 40 years helping others find work. Janice, great to have you on the show. Wonderful to be Thank here. Thank you so much Wonderful. for joining us. So, Dr. Ford, you know, nobody's going to really believe all that stuff is possible, except that they can Google and find it out. I mean, your bio is incredible. The first thing I want to do, though, even before we go into what what kind of childhood you had that created this person you are today, that 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 nurtured the person you are today. I, I really want to just find out a little bit that's on everybody's mind. You know, we're just about to transition administrations and you've worked so effectively through several administrations, irrespective of uh, political leaning. Yeah. And so what's it been like, the work you've been doing right now with Biden-Harris? You know, it's it's been exciting. So first of all, again, thank you for having me. And I, I love this first question. You know, the Biden-Harris campaign uh, has been a, it's been twofold of interesting things. Number one, it's been somewhat of a reunion. Some of the folks I work with in the Obama administration, some was reconnected to support um, the, the Biden-Harris campaign. But the second thing that's been really exciting has been just the the, the the excitement around knowledge, the excitement around respect of others, the excitement around how can we make our country better given what's happening in our economy, what's happening with the pandemic. And so th this has been almost uh, like a military clarion call where people want to serve. And so there's been a, a great esprit de corps there's also been um, kind of unbeknownst uh, to maybe the media is that there is a genuine interest to be inclusive. 
uh, Biden Harris beyond just the optics of, of Kamala Harris, our, our wonderful vice president elect, there's been an intentionality in every policy strategy to be inclusive, to understand underrepresented communities, how they've been impacted, not only historically, but how do we move forward? How do we turn pages? How do we solve problems? And so that part, literally, I worked on multiple policies and in every policy that we, we discussed and built strategies around, there was intentionality in being very inclusive, not only in leadership, but in the actual policies and how we plan to implement those policies. That part has been very exciting and refreshing. It has to be. Uh, just exactly what has your role been? You know, I just spoke uh, uh, quickly around the fact that you did offer service, but what exactly has your role been? What does that sound like to somebody who's not familiar with how these transitions occur and the yes. planning? So yeah, for, for folks who you know who, who don't necessarily read in, in the fine print of media or in newspapers, what happens in a, during a presidential transition, even before that, during the campaign, uh, I, I've been a supporter since you know well well into the campaign, and one of the things that that has to be done is you have a plan, you plan out your policy agenda. This happens well before the election. You plan out your first hundred days. You plan out what happens if successful during that transition. And so, what my particular role was really to shape policy in areas of my expertise, passion, and interest. And so, what that looked like is okay, concerning issues around COVID 19, what's going to be a strategy day one? What's going to be a strategy in preparation for entering day one? And then, what's going to happen in the first hundred days? Uh, maybe a second area you may want to look at what's going to happen with the economy. So what does that look like from day one, day 100? What policy things that we need to do immediately? What things do we need to do in terms of getting ready as we enter? And so from, from my particular role is to help design strategy, design policy, and then think through what stakeholders, how they're, imp how they're impacted, what federal agencies need to be communicated with, what does that look like from a, from a Capitol Hill standpoint, our legislative branch. And so all these things are embedded into a very sophisticated system. If, if folk may not realize this, uh, the president-elect has to hire probably about 4,000 people. And so those 4,000 people have to actually fit into a very sophisticated plan from policy to working with the Hill to working with the executive branch, all those cabinet members that have been announced here over the last couple of weeks, all that is very well thought out hundreds upon hundreds of people are, are implement are part of the implementation strategy. Well, you know, I'm in the uh, workforce business, so hiring 4,000 people uh, isn't as overwhelming to me, but what is amazing is the amount of time you have to do that within. So certainly some of that shadow planning has occurred before you know whether or not you won in the election. Um, and what's that big book called? There's a big book that I forget the name of that actually has all 4,000 of those positions in it that have to be hired for. So um, if you can't remember, I'll certainly share it with folks. I, your your guess is as good as mine. I just know there. I know the office that is responsible. That there's a, a presidential uh, HR office um, that is responsible for that. I am not familiar with the book. You got me on that one. So. And I know also that people can apply online if they want to yes. serve in an administration. And because I have friends from across the political spectrum, I know that many of my friends, regardless of whether they're Republican, Democrat, or you know even. Uh, uh, um, not committed or to a particular party are applying for service right now. There's just something about the season that uh, we're in in a global uh, environment that people want to uh, help us with. Do you now? You are a scientist. Yes. Um, you are also a man of faith. Yes. So maybe before I go into further. The, uh, the way people can serve in the administration. I wanna talk about how you served in your life. Um, tell us who Dr. Chris Ford is. Talk a little bit about growing up. We wanna know the little boy before he became the man in front of us. Well, first, I would say, if you didn't know me now, and I even even growing up, I am, I love Jesus. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. It's not just about a Sunday thing. It's an everyday thing. It's an interpersonal thing. It's how I treat people. Uh, I, don't, I don't need to be able to announce that I'm a Christian. I, I would like to have left an impression that you will at least have a a query of <clears throat> understanding who I am as a person and know there's a love, a genuine love. But as a 
as a person growing up in Ohio, very humble beginnings uh, from Akron, Ohio, uh, growing up in, in Ohio, if those who may remember, uh, there is a, uh, it's called the rubber town, rubber capital of the world. And growing up, I would smell rubber and bread. And so there was a there was a um, a, a bread factory right in the smack downtown of Akron, Ohio. And so for me, that the smell of science and industry was in the air, but also the smell of bread. And so those who have a, a Christian or, or Judeo Christian faith, that smelled like manna. So there was things that I would smell. Literally, there was something magical about science, things magical about how do you make the world better. And so growing up, my parents, um, who have both of my, my heroes in my life in terms of planting seeds, uh, my father, who God rest his soul, just recently passed, uh, was a very, very um, creative man, an artist. Uh, could, he could, was untrained, um, uh, amazing artist, could draw, paint anything he could see. He was very creative. My mother was a very calculating person. I get all of my reasoning, analytical skills from her, the, my memory skills from her, the ability to create things in reality as an entrepreneur I get from my father. And so growing up in Ohio, where it was a lot of poverty, my parents were not college educated, um, but they put so much love and faith. I, I never was told I couldn't do anything. Uh, my mom, my parents, just my mom had one rule. Uh, I, if I started something, I had to finish. I was not allowed to quit. <clears throat> and so with this, so being in those very impoverished environment, um, I was able to dream and imagine my first dream as a child was to, to be an astronaut. Um, at, if, for those who may remember in the Challenger explosion there in 1986, I was in kindergarten and, and um, there was a, a woman on that, Judy Resnick, who was on that flight who was from Akron, Ohio. She was a Firestone High School alum. And I remember reading about her and was so excited that she was from my hometown and she was so brilliant that she was able to make that fly. Unfortunately, obviously she passed, but I was inspired by that. It maybe sounds strange seeing the explosion somehow inspired me to want to be an And I eventually did end up working at NASA for a period. <laughs> and so, um, but that, that inquisitiveness, um, being able to imagine um, something that's not even there despite your surroundings. I, I grew up very much an optimist, still am an optimist and believe, you know, as, as a man of faith, I do believe I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. And so my parents put that in me and then just create an environment. They didn't let poverty, they didn't let lack. They just put books in front of me. Uh, my, my background has a bunch of books in it right now because I love to read, but my parents put the love of reading and searching and letting knowledge be at your fingertips. You, my dad had a, had a quote, um, you know, you know let, don't let your head, use your head for more than a hat rack. And so meaning put things in it, read. Uh, they would never, as another quick point, uh, if I would ask them, my, my nickname as a child was Curious George because I always would ask questions about everything. And I remember Curious George. <laughs> so Curious George is a curious little monkey. So my parents would not give me the answer. They would say, go look it up. So we had multiple encyclopedias. This is before the internet, before Google. So they had multiple encyclopedias. So I would spend hours in encyclopedias. I, had old, I have older siblings. And my older sister, when she went to college and she would leave her books from college home, I would sneak and, and read her college textbooks. So anyway, I just love knowledge as a kid. And so being able to imagine allowed me to do a lot of pretty cool and amazing things. And then you went off to university. Yes, yes. So uh, Morehouse College was the first place I received uh, my first training in terms of education. And I, the story behind Morehouse, uh, my father, and my parents, both history buffs, both children of the 60s, meaning the civil rights movement. And so my father, um, as a small child, would play the I Have a Dream speech on a record, on a 45 record, for those who know what that looks like. Um, um, and he would play that you know the this the the music the, the the tenor of that speech and also outside of my bedroom as a child my dad had a sculpture uh, of Martin Luther King outside my bedroom so I had all these images of of more of Morehouse and Martin Luther King Jr. who was a Morehouse alum and so I had a vision probably in the middle of high school that I wanted to go to a historically black college university uh, I knew I was going to go to college to be eventually become an engineer but I wanted to go to a black college and so I did a tour in high school. Um, and I uh, went to a number of historical black college universities and something when I got to Atlanta and saw the history and the mystique of, of Morehouse, 
uh, I just, I had to figure out a way to get to Morehouse. So by the grace of God, I ended up winning um, a, a Ronnie McNair scholarship. Mc, Ronnie McNair, so who was a North Carolina North Carolina a <laughs> <laughs> so he, who also died, unfortunately, on the Challenger explosion, uh, but he, they had a scholarship in his name, and I was one of the fortunate recipients of the Ronnie Manier NASA scholarship, and so. Can you talk a little bit more, even, I mean, you, you go quickly from your childhood and seeing Dr. King and listening to Dr. King and living his message through your parents' uh, guidance, and then you go off to Morehouse, but talk a little bit about Morehouse, because, you know, um, Every, every person who isn't a, a student of it won't understand just how important More, Morehouse is in and of itself. Morehouse, so founded in one of, one of the schools founded by the Freedmen's Bureau. So for those who don't have a history of what happened after slavery, there was a number of institutions created to educate formerly, formerly enslaved Africans. And so the Freedmen's Bureau was a, one of the amazing bureaus that created a number of colleges. So Morehouse is one of those colleges that also has a connection to the church. And so Morehouse is an is a all-male university that is dedicated to raising leaders leaders of, of men to be well-learned, to be also well-rounded. So it's a liberal arts college. And so one of the things about Morehouse, for those who, who've never been or haven't ever encountered um, the, the institution, we have weekly meetings every week at Morehouse that we hear great speakers um, that tell you about leadership, about being great at whatever you do, You're a call to service to make your world a better place. And so for your time there, you get indoctrinated with a message that you can do amazing things and that you can be a leader and that you can do a, a great things. And so in addition to that, as freshmen, you have also a second seminar, a freshman seminar that does the very same thing to indoctrinate you. Uh, if you want to you know, put it in juxtapose to this, this society, for all the negative images that you may see for the Black community, Morehouse completely destroys that. You, you are inundated with positive messaging, imaging, and you leave there. The, the joke they have about Morehouse, man, is that, um, is that we are over, overly confident. And that, that may be uh, in, in terms of what you're used to seeing in terms of how Black men are perceived in media, but when you know your history, that you know who you are, we celebrate our strength as men, as leaders of our community. And so you leave with a confidence. You're, you know, you walk with your back straight. And so Morehouse Beyond, whatever degree you may choose from there, you are left with this fraternity-like experience of you are a call to serve, to do great things, and to be leaders of whatever you may choose to do and have a responsibility of doing great things. So that that is one of the reasons that drew me to Morehouse was that, that experience from being a place. And Dr. Ford, um, Help me understand uh, if I'm correct on this. Many schools have a matriculation challenge. Morehouse hasn't been one of those schools that's suffered from that so much. Most kids who enter as freshmen leave as seniors graduate, don't they? It's, I haven't seen the most recent stats, though all schools have had its challenges, but Morehouse I, it's, it'd be interesting. To, it'd be an interesting research study, but they have done a really good job. And maybe, maybe the maybe the short answer is to, is is the community that builds. So I'm my brother's keeper. Those things are serious and real. Uh, when I, if you see, a, if I've never met a, a Morehouse man, I see him on the street right now. There's an already built in love. Um, so I think there's a, a community effect that is there. Maybe as a part of, you know, Morehouse has a tradition of of seeing taking gems or, or diamonds in the rough and taking them through a crucible of time and pressure to, to buffer them into greatness. And so I think the, the leadership and the administration, though some things have changed, I know there are some who are still there that have a true call to see that young men become great and are loved on. So I, I, it would be interesting studies of why Morehouse is, I've been asked some questions like that in different um, uh, framings of what is it, what is different about Morehouse and how some of the outcomes seem to be somewhat immune to other things that other places may experience. And, and one thing I will say before we leave the subject of Morehouse, and you have certainly illustrious alum who join you, who uh, our family can uh, Google Morehouse and see. Uh, one thing I, I, I will uh, offer up is that when men leave Morehouse, they take that same character of leadership and spirit of community into their workplaces, their homes, and their communities that they live and serve in. 
Um, and I, 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 I've witnessed that. I have yet to meet a Morehouse grad who does not give beyond his talent around a career. There's always the community engagement or the service aspect of how they live. So there's definitely something in the formula. Indeed. Indeed. Maybe to, to add to that, if some of the you know great men who have led that institution, who have shaped it, um, Benjamin Elijah Hay, uh, Mays, you'll see him, his statue there, matter of fact, right in front of Graves Hall, where is the, fre the, the honors freshman dorm, those who, who went to Mars know what I mean. Uh, but some of his quotes, uh, he was the mentor of Dr. King, one of the great leaders of the institution, and, and, and inbred it into Dr. King, embedded into the institution, this notion of service that we, we are to aim high, um, we are to aim uh, expansively, but we are to make sure that our community is better, that we are our brother's keeper, and that we care about how we leave things better than we found it. Well, you've certainly done that. I think you are really an illustrious alum and I, I'm sure uh, your parents had years of joy you know, knowing, knowing, the, uh, knowing the direction you were going. Let's talk a little bit of, though, Dr. Chris, about how you blend uh, this idea of science and faith together. I know my mom has often said to us, the more I see science, the more I know God. I wouldn't <laughs> relegate you that simply uh, to, uh, to, to that thought, but, Talk, talk with us a little bit about how you, how you're such a strong man of faith and such a, an accomplished and serious man of science. It's interesting. So, and probably in our current 21st century mindset, um, we see maybe a divergence between science and faith, given our current political and social climate. But if you go back to, say, the 18th century, as an example, uh, the men that shaped science were also men of faith. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, for those who've taken physics uh, or, or especially thermodynamics, uh, Max Planck, Planck's constant, um, he was a man of faith uh, who actually Max Planck in his pursuit of seeing a universal constant, he pursued that from a belief that God had created a universe, that actually there was some sort of universal constant out of it. So his faith actually drove his science actually. And so uh, for me personally, the, you know, my relate, you know, my relationship to Jesus Christ actually came through the observations of the laws of thermodynamics. And so I as any person growing up, you know, especially with family from the South, you've been introduced to Jesus from the time you were born. But until, but when but the question is, when did you have a real relationship, a personal relationship with Jesus? And so I, I remember it, it, literally my first year of graduate school taking an advanced thermodynamics course and the professor made a statement about second law of thermodynamics and made a statement about heat travels from hot to cold. You know, so meaning, meaning that if something, if you put a warm body near a cold body, the, the cold body will actually warm up in temperature. And so he made a statement about that and then made the point, well, that's just the way Mother Nature made it. And so the, the Holy Spirit at the time, it wouldn't necessarily call this voice the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit said, well, who is Mother Nature? And so that one question haunted me. So by this point, I have a degree in- So are in, you suggesting that God is a woman? I don't know, keep going, God. <laughs> <laughs> keep going. So, <laughs> so um, you know, uh, the, the notion of God and, and the creation. So I was literally uh, in a, a dumbfounded I, I, for, for weeks, just thought about, and, and mind you, at this point, I had an undergraduate degree in math and engineering, mechanical engineering from Georgia, but from Georgia Tech. And I could understand the laws. I could write out all the equations. And so um, I end up right now, looked at the equations and from my interpretation of the laws of thermodynamics, I concluded there had to be some entity that destroyed all the chaos and what we would call entropy in, in engineering. There had to be some entity that had to be to, to balance the equation. And so for me, that entity's name is Jesus. And so the, 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 the I had this moment, I was uh, started to have a faith discussion through the lens of science. And so- You were I, at Georgia Tech then? I was at Georgia Tech then in grad school, my first year of grad school. 
And okay. so God spoke to me through the laws of thermodynamics. And then I had to, you know, I had all these notions about God that caused me to want to study the Bible, not just be at church and reading the scripture along with the pastor, but I wanted to study it and learn it for my own self. And so I convinced myself of the existence of Jesus Christ, first from a framework of science and then confirmed it in, in, the, in the scriptures. And so it was a, a so for me, there is a, 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 a natural marriage between faith and God, and I can see I can see Jesus Christ in the laws of thermodynamics. So. Wow, wow. Um, let me ask you a couple of questions. One being, as you are a follower of Christ, many of my friends I've met have a great respect for Christ, even if they're not Christian, regardless of their faith relationship. And my friends tend to have faith relationships. Um, regardless of their faith relationship, they respect that Jesus was a man on earth. Yes. And had some really cool ideas. Mm -hmm. um, how do you how do you place your faith in Christ and being a Christian? alongside, I'm sure, the many people of faith you meet who are not Christian or those who are absent a religious relationship? You know, it's a, I, I look at God and my faith in Jesus Christ. Now, I, I, I'm convinced of the scriptures that, you know, those who want to receive God and receive heaven come through Christ. Now, that journey to get to there looks different for, for it's, it's as infinite of many ways as that we have a uh, uniqueness of our own fingerprints. I think there's a unique path that we all come to our relationship with God and if it's his will for us to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so my my encounter with other faith, I'll tell you a story in grad school that sums up really nicely. There was a, a Muslim gentleman um, who was a, who we shared an office um, in grad school, a devout Muslim. And um, one day, you know, we had a, this very conversation about, he said he respected, you know, the people of the book. And he talked about respecting Jesus as a prophet. And he shared on his faith about Muhammad. And so one day he invited me during Ramadan to one of their break, their breaking of their fast. So I went to his local, um, you know, his, his local mosque, fellowship with him, shared faith. And, and so we shared food. And then a, a few weeks later, or a few days later, I should say, we then had more conversations about faith. And so he, I, it hit me fellowshipping with him did not dilute my faith in Jesus Christ. It actually, we exchanged. I talked about Abraham, how his lineage leads to, eventually leads to um, the, the, the Muslim faith and how I'm a, I'm a child of Jesus Christ. And so he marveled at my convictions about Jesus Christ and my love of Jesus Christ. And, and to be frank, um, we got to one point in our, in our discussion, it was never hostile at all, very loving and, and, and kind, where the issue of the cross it's the issue of the cross. And we talked about sin and the remission of sin. At that point, that's where there was a divergence. I said, I believe my sins are, are paid for by the work that Jesus did on the cross. And I'm convinced of it. That, that is the gospel. That is the good news. And so that is where there's a divergence. He doesn't believe in the resurrection. I believe in the resurrection. And so it's okay to believe. And I'll say this way, as a, as a people of, of love and family, in families, we can have disagreements, but still be in love. And so we lovingly disagree, but I didn't change how I loved him or treated him or how he treated me. We just, as, as family members, we decided to have a disagreement, to agree to disagree, but I didn't disrespect him. And similarly, those who may of other faiths or don't have a faith, as my call as a Christian and I'm my, convic my conviction and com uh, being convinced of the gospel is to love and let Jesus, because the revelation of God happens how God wants it to happen. It's not by what man does. You know, the Bible says it was some plant, some water, but God gives the increase. So it's not my job to convince anyone, but to love them, share my faith and, and trueness and authenticity, and let God be God and whatever whatever his will is for them will manifest. That, that's my com conviction and confidence in Christ and his message. Well, Dr. Ford, I know so many people are listening right now and very impressed with your obvious respect for your Muslim brother and your admiration of him. Um, 
and I have to say I am as well. When we look at where you are in science, and if you will, just take a moment to uh, talk a little bit about where you are in science, because I'm going to want you to guide us a little further on one particular topic, but can you just talk about where you are in science, what your relationship to science is, and it, and in particular, your field of science? Sure. So my my specific and explicit areas of expertise related to science is the area of, of energy systems, thermodynamics, and heat transfer. So my PhD was on uh, the entropy <laughs> generation. Uh, I won't say the whole thermodynamic optimization of a planar solid oxide fuel cell. What that means is um, taking the laws of energy, uh, thermodynamics, and how do you design energy systems? And so say that one more time to sound like a rapper. <laughs> <laughs> so the thermodynamic optimization of planar solid dioxide fuel cells. So, so what my expertise is looking at, how do you look at energy systems? How do you optimize them? How do you elucidate optimal designs under different constraints? Now, where I sit in that, my area now of research has evolved. Uh, my secondary area is related to um, what's called technology transfer commercialization. How do you take all that amazing science and then translate into products and services? So how do you take a fuel cell or battery, as I just described, um, uh, and, and then convert that to a business. And so there is a translation. I remember, I remember <laughs> you uh, facilitating and escorting visits I had at some of the national labs. Maybe yes. you need to talk a little bit about the national labs as well. Yeah. A lot of people aren't familiar with them or even, nor do they even know they exist. If as much as you're able to talk. Yes. You so, did a lot of work. You did a lot of work. With so the, uh, my, my, I did research for years for the Department of Energy, National Energy, uh, one of the labs is the National Energy Technology Lab in Morgantown, West Virginia. I also did research for the Navy, uh, Office of Naval Research out, uh, Naval under, Naval under, uh, Naval Underwater Warfare um, Center out in, in uh, Northeast in, in Rhode Island. Um, and so my area was how do you design energy systems for different applications? So for Department of Energy, it was about designing futuristic power plants that use that were able to use uh, clean coal uh, technologies to, to create new, new power systems. Uh, for the Navy, uh, designing weapons that could travel longer. <laughs> and so using some alternative <laughs> energy systems. And so I had I spent years working for, for labs. Um, and then that allowed me also to understand how to create knowledge, how to create science and products and services. And so um, I transitioned to the translation of that research into product. So I worked for the national uh, for the Department of Energy for five years, um, helping folks partake of our national lab infrastructure. We have so we have as a country, about 40 federally funded research development centers across the Department of Energy, all the federal agencies. The Department of Energy in particular has 17 national labs, of one which I worked at. Um, and what I worked on for the Obama administration was helping businesses, helping entrepreneurs, helping universities partner with these labs to do, say, if they were interested in energy research, there's a whole energy portfolio of labs that do energy research. If you're interested in cybersecurity, and technology, there's a whole portfolio of labs to do cybersecurity related research. And how do you, can you partner with them, learn about that research, and then can you figure out a pathway to commercialize that research? And so one of the biggest and it problems- it goes everywhere from oil and gas to thermal to anything that uh, basically uses an atom in energy, doesn't it? it this, that, exactly. So the amazing thing about, um, say for the Department of Energy specifically, it's not just energy. Um, so it can be all forms of energy, alternative oil and gas, as mentioned, but it does material research around materials, uh, technology, information technology systems, cyber, biotech. Uh, there are a number of products on the market right now um, that are solving fighting COVID-19 that were invented at the Department of Energy. They made glue that didn't stick well. And so as a research and development organization, they, they, they were able to figure out a commercialization path for glue that does not stick well. And, and as it turns out, some very smart uh, assistants uh, were able to, to surmise that this will, as I got poster notes in my office here, uh, so we were, able, <laughs> we were able to, um, to, to use that. So, and in that's my the, books, in my books. <laughs> absolutely. So, and that's a simple example of, of research that some people may not, uh, it, it, there, there may be something invented 
that you may not see or the lab or the research that may not see a, a direct application for, but some amazing entrepreneur or some very creative researcher could imagine a different application for. You all also are working in your own company around some of this as well. Can you talk a little bit about maybe in general where we are, but more specifically where you think we can be? Because we keep hearing people are scared right now. Yeah. And as you alluded to us being in a transition um, season for politics, we're also in a transition season for a lot of people in their personal security yeah. and the implication of where their governments are in that. And that's global. Everybody knows somebody who's had it, you know, um, but most of the folks I'm talking with are more concerned about when is the next one coming? What's the next one like and how protected can we be? Will we ever get a normal that feels like hugging and, and, and hurting and, and, right. and being able to fly again comfortably and talk to the person? One of my favorite uh, places I would meet people was on an airplane. Right. You know? right. And so uh, taking all of that and putting it in a bowl or, or should I say, what do you science issues, right? In a beaker. Pe probably a Petri dish is probably okay, most appropriate in, right now because that's what it and, feels and, like. <laughs> it'll make some sense for us of right. this. So, you know, it's it's a few things to say on that. Just the, we have to, you know, be able to, with that this, this is not a short term, you know, pandemic, unfortunately. So we have to start adjusting and adapting our minds to think of this in a multi-year, uh, uh, problem. So this, you know, I, I tell in my own family, we've prepared, I tell folks it, at the earliest 2022 till we start to even think about returning to some level of normalcy. And the reason being, and, and this is if you go back even to look at the Spanish flu of the flu pandemic of 1918, the, the challenge is, is that this virus is unique, it's mutating. It has had thousands of thousands of pounds of mutations. And the challenges are we we have to number one understand that and i hope this hope doesn't sound too dark and gloomy but the reality is thank god for a vaccine i think the vaccine will be helpful but there's no there won't be in my opinion true herd immunity because of how fast this thing mutates so that's the number one so with that and with that understanding we have to start to prepare our realities for a long-term battle so secondly we have to at least in the united states we have to um, have a new normal of mask. We have to have a new normal of cleaning, cleaning, washing our hands. We have to adapt of until we see more accessibility of testing, till we have a better understanding of, we, this, this is important to scientists, we still are learning about this virus. It's only been not even a year. In the United States, technically 12 months, you know, if you want to look at it from its time in China. So we are still learning. It is rare to come to understand a virus. So are we treating it back then with the vaccine versus cause? Say that one more time, Mr. Are the we treating then effect with this vaccine versus cause? Well, the, the, the vaccine is, is using those, a, new, a, a new platform they've used to invent, a, a, to create a vaccine in less than a year, where it typically takes, to, you know, no less than 10 years. The, the, you're taking a, whether it's mRNA or some sort of other technique, and you're taking actual viral material and deactivating it, and then injecting that into your body. So it's just that you build the antibodies to be able to well, fight. They did that to me as a little girl, didn't they? I got the shot in the arm and then I, I don't remember how long after they gave us a sugar cube with stuff in it. Right, certain vaccines work. And so you may talk about say the polio vaccine or other you know things, but, the, but why those vaccines could work uh, is because polio is not mutating 10,000 times in 12 months. And so that's one of the challenges with this virus is mutating, though they have you know, targeted and designed the vaccine such that the it's attacking a certain protein that allows you to be able to create a type of antibody that resists, that helps to resist the, the infection. However, the mutation rates is too fast. So I say this way, this is how I'd like to, in a very plain speak, talk about it. Is there, a, a, a permanent flu vaccine. And that's the flu shots we get every year is because they get new doses for the new strain of, of influenza A or B that comes out every year. And so there's no elixir for influenza A or B. Now with, I think um, precautions that we can do to fight this better is 
right, vaccinate those who are very, you know, sensitive populations, PPE, you know, protective personal equipment, use that as much as possible, clean, washing of hands. I think we have to just let this virus die down and go away. That's that what the, if you look at what happened with the, the Spanish flu of 1918, it took two years, two years for that to go away. And so they didn't have a vaccine. They didn't even have biology in terms of antibiotics to treat. And a lot of times, some of the deaths from that were had nothing to do with the virus itself, with some of the conditions that were created because of the infection. And so I, I think we just need to be, if we can be disciplined for about a year to a year and a half, I think we can fight this through. Uh, it just eventually will go away. Now, if it doesn't, we I, what I'm concerned about with the vaccine is that you know, as a scientist, you know, typically we have to study side effects. We have to study all those things. And so that's my only concern is that this has been rolled out so fast and that we haven't considered all the scenarios for public safety and interest in such a short amount of time. But it, for those who need to take it or at risk, I definitely see the good science says we should take it. For those who are at risk, I think it should be done. However, I still think there is caution to be had with that. Now, you know, um, as an African-American scientist, what message are you sending to the African-American community when most of our politicians are telling us, please take this vaccine and, you know, whether thoughts go toward Miss Evers' boys or various experiments and, you know, um, African-American relationship to science in America, how do you how do you parallel I, or platform your conversation? Because you, you know, weren't speaking in terms of African Americans, you were speaking in terms of a whole global population. Right. I However, gonna, you are an African American, yes. highly respected scientist. What, here's, so most the, people would think you would have taken that into consideration. Here, here's the part, if, and we look at the stats, you know, some cities, some of the deaths and infection rates for African Americans is 80% of the deaths and infections in some, especially in highly urban areas. What, and it, beyond talking about a vaccine, with the, the major issue I've had with how things are being handled currently, and I and I hope this will be handled, I, the, the rhetoric is behind this, we need to more edu better education. We need to understand social distancing, per personal protective equipment. People need to have masks. People need to understand social distancing. And, and this is the problem with what COVID has exposed the healthcare inequalities in our country, um, some of the, the the economic inequalities, which also are, are an indicator of uh, healthcare quality. Unfortunately, the this pandemic has exposed some structural, um, dare I say, institutionalized racism issues in our country, such that disinformation campaigns, lack of access to adequate housing, lack of access to proper healthcare, lack of access to even just being able to have knowledge about diets and proper health. And so folks with pre-existing conditions are more at risk. Uh, folks in, in really confined environments are more at risk. And so not understanding how to properly have things be clean, uh, how to sanitize things, how to have wear masks, all these different protocols. My message to, to, to the Black community is we need to definitely have a, a, a stronger focus on our health beyond, beyond just this pandemic. We need to deal with these issues, underlying issues of diabetes, these other issues of hypertension, all these things that make us more susceptible to this disease. We also, and this is what I hope for the message, we hope the new administration will solve all our problems, but I hope this is a part of the, you know, some of the strategies going forward is understanding that at-risk communities such as the Black community needs access to more protective personal equipment. We need access to better health care. They, you know, and people don't realize it's, it's going to take at least a year before, even under ideal circumstances, for a vaccine to be rolled out to the entire population. So in that time, you have to do all these other measures. So proper education on social distancing, proper access to health care, proper access to mask and equip all those things need to be supported by the government. So that's what my message is. is I, I tell my family, you know, to social distance as much as you can. Uh, be wise about um, how you're gathering. Um, be wise about how you're taking care of yourself. Be wise. What about does it look things. like in your home getting food products or those things that you used to shop for that you consider essential? Um, what, what does that look like in your home? Does it stay outdoors for three days? Do you bring it in and wipe it with Clorox wipes? Uh, 
you know, how do you tip the UPS and the FedEx guy? Uh, what what does it look we, like? Just we, stuff for all we, of us. We we are very very cautious in our home. So we have, if you go to our front door, we have. Um, and by the way, my wife is a healthcare worker, by the way. So, so you have a scientist with the healthcare professional. So it's going to be extremely tight and clean. So we bleach everything. And though we have read all the studies about how long the virus can stay on surfaces, we just have a practice in our home. We have sanitation wipes. We wipe down everything in our home that comes in. Everything is <laughs> everything that comes out is touched with bleach or a sanitation wipe. Um, we uh unbag everything outside, um, clean it before it comes in, um, hand, hand washing. When we go outside, uh, whether we run an errand, we come back in, we immediately take a shower. Um, our clothes go immediately into a, you know, our, our, our laundry room. And within a day, they must be washed. So we have practices and protocols in our home that everything must be clean. Um, uh, hand, multiple, multiple hand washing, making sure even when we're you know, outside that we have to um, uh, make sure that um, we are cleansed, thoroughly cleansed. You know, something that didn't occur to me uh, in the first throes of this pandemic that I actually got sight of by a conversation I was having with someone else. I, there are a lot of people in this country who can't even order things they're not set up financially yeah to be able to have an account with right. amazon or with a with a, a instacart mm -hmm. and so they literally are walking out getting stuff and buying yep. it on a two or three day basis as far as their finances take them and those aren't just the people who we typically think of as being on the lower income strata. Now, a lot of people are falling into that because they've blown up their credit cards through this. And yeah. so they're facing unique challenges. Um, so the idea of cleanliness and, and, and uh, the sanitation practices we're talking about, they become huge indicators about when it circles back to us because we're not going to be... Uh, while we are tribal in so many ways, harmful and helpful, we are not going to be an, even an economy that can afford to not interact with each other. That virus, right. if it has a high mutation rate and England's experiencing some of right. that, is going to hit people um, back in the face if we don't care, take care of everyone. You know, there used to be a saying about the least of us, you know, yep. I think Jesus talked about you do you've done it for the least of them, mm -hmm. you've done it for me. Mm -hmm. Literally, we can put ourselves in Jesus' shoes regardless of where we come from, right. uh, from a religious perspective. And if we don't get everybody cured up, all of us are gonna continue to uh, face sickness. Indeed. If yeah. what you say is true from a scientific perspective. And, and then that's the part that I'm concerned about. I think beyond it, you, you mentioned England. I have friends in, in Africa as an example, and you know they're seeing things. They don't have access to the testing. They don't have access to as much. Um, and so I'm concerned of those you know, countries and those who are disenfranchised or may not be as developed and have access, you know, it's, it's going to be pillaging uh, communities. And, and that's where, this is what I'm most concerned about as I look at long-term effects of, of the pandemic is you're going to see in some instances, economic restarts and, and economic um, uh, setbacks. And so how are we thinking about that as a country? How are we thinking about that? Because one of the things that uh, I look at the current administration coming in and just what we do as entrepreneurs, what we do as community members, how are we thinking about that? Uh, one of the things that I've proposed to the current Biden-Harris um, campaign is that we need to be thinking about that in such a way as how do we help transition already devastated communities economically? How do we help transition them uh, leapfrog strategies beyond this pandemic. Let's let's take this pandemic as an opportunity to help rebuild places that have already been struggling anyway. Let's figure out how do we properly resource a, a turnaround for those who already are struggling. And I think that's in, in the midst of, of this tragedy or this pandemic, I think that's the opportunity for those who have been left behind. Maybe this is a chance for those who are able to and are interested that we can find strategies and solutions to help them get ahead or at least catch up um, to, to other parts of our society. 
How much do you think uh, political polarization will play on the ability for us to move forward? Because, you know, this is kind of a unique time in the history of of the world we are, and I've said this publicly several times, for the first time, we're all solving for the same solution at the same time. Right. Um, and we've got technologies and I wanna get to the exciting world of STEM and you know, right. I'm always promoting STEM. I started a company, All STEM, to ensure that all people get opportunities into STEM careers. Um, we got, we've got a bit more, a, a, a pathing before we get to that point in the journey, though. Right. How, right. how how do you think the um, how do you think the political environment will play? Will it hold polarized, or the elections over and after January we start to work on some things, even if we hold other ideas about the election? Is this is. So is that big for you? Are you crystal balling, or do you have any historic? Uh, perspective to share forward on how we operate as people. I crystal I do both. I said some historical precedents and some some maybe crystal a little bit of crystal ball. I started with the latter first. So what I see now, especially if you look at the state of Georgia, which has had about six hundred million dollars <laughs> invested into that the, the senatorial, the Senate races there um, with you know Pastor Warnock and John Offsa running against Kelly Lefter and, and Kevin uh, Purdue. What what you know, what we need to understand is that our Senate right now is, you know, if, if it turns blue, will be 50-50, 50 Democrat, 50 Republican. Um, and that now with an executive branch that allows for um, the president of the Senate, which in this instance with uh, President-elect, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris, she will have the casting vote to decide um, 51, uh, 51st vote to break that tie. So yes, there will be, Polarization. It's already baked into the to the process. If you saw to you know what's in, in recent things with the stimulus bill and how that became very much a partisan issue primarily. And so, what what I see happening is that uh, there will be an opportunity for some bipartisanship. And here's what it will look like. Things related to economic recovery, there will be different ways that folks want to see that happen, but things that create jobs, things that help businesses to create jobs, things that help our economy go forward, I think that's where we see a lot of our partisanship. Are they um, going to be calling me? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, they should, and I, I will hope they will, and I hope that they will call folks like us who see, like, you know, though I've worked in democratically facing administrations, I... I actually see things very much in a very centric, very middle of the road bipartisanship manner, meaning I believe in entrepreneurship and capitalism. I believe in job creation. That's a both Democratic and Republican ethos. And so what, what we will see, I think that's where things will, will find bipartisanship issues. Now, the polarization will start because it's politics. Right now, we just our, our politics becoming more and more polarized. I, unfortunately, I would liken it to if you look at what has happened when we had major shifts. Um, in our country. You look at probably the last big shift um, was, I would say, the civil rights era. When our country shifted, last time Georgia, other than um, Jimmy Carter was was blue, was during Lyndon Bates Johnson. And so when when the great, the, the Southern Compromise for the Civil Rights um, Act, that was the last time when the South was Democrat. And so it was, it was democratic facing. And so what's going to happen now is that history has told us that there is a particular segment of the Republican Party that used to be what's called Dixiecrats within the Democratic Party that's now turned conservative. That polarization is going to stay the same. And this is part we don't understand about um, our, how polarized we actually are. There are factions within the Democratic Party that, excuse me, within the Republican Party used to be Democrat. And so there are factions that were there within the Democratic Party that's now Republican. And so what people don't understand is that it's about the game of politics. So it's not about red or blue. It's about who has power and who doesn't and how and what are the and what are the mechanisms by which that power is had. So I'll give you an example. Maybe my, my crystal ball is that those very conservative Democrats will be very powerful. 
Um, there is a few, there is a few as an example in, in Appalachia that I think will be powerful. There will be few um, who are out west who have for, who are Democrats with very conservative values. They will be very powerful, and as you align with them to get things done or their strategies, I think you'll be very successful. The, the other side of it is, and this is important for those um, who are in positions to affect change. We can't put all of our success of our future on the backs of the government. We have to understand how we work with government to affect change. One of the biggest problems that I would say for the black community specifically, which you know, I know best and well, um, is that we have oftentimes looked to the government to solve our problems or we have put too much faith in the government to solve our problems, where we need to understand how we work with government, how we utilize government to solve problems. And that's where we have to, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, you have to understand what is the role of government in solving the problems you care about and how do you partner with them? How do you leverage them? How do you leverage your local policymakers? How do you leverage your, your, your national uh, uh, executive branch members. That's where, you know, uh, I encourage folks to analyze their own personal civics, how they understand local government, national government, and what it means to the problems that you care about. So is some of your uh, faith-based teach them how to fish uh, creeping into your ideas around the importance of uh, creating self-sustainability within a political system? Yes, yes. And to and maybe give add to that phrasing, we teach them how to fish and then maybe give them either a grant for some to get some fish to start with and some bait <laughs> to, to get a boat and to build so that then they can, they have been trained on how to fish. They can get a head starting and subsidizing some of that early risk to build, a, a in this example, a business that can go go out there and fish. And that's where um, for disenfranchised communities, the black community, the, some of the, the underserved communities, they understanding how do you be taught to fish and then how do you get some resources to subsidize that initial risk? That, and that's the part that's been missing, especially for a lot of Black entrepreneurs, is that initial risk capital, those initial risk resources are scarce and hard to come by. But if you got an entrepreneur who can be taught how to fish in this example, and then get some resources to get a boat and to get some fishing reels and to get some bait so they can get started, then they won't need, you know, have a thriving, uh, you know, a fishing business conglomerate in a few years. So that's, that's what I'm advocating for. Well, listen, you, I mean, you've taught faith, science, business, government. We're in a real time right now where everybody's got all of that out loud differently than before, huh? Yes, yes. The and it maybe, does it take a little bit of all of that together to help us move forward? I, here's, I think we're going through a, a political inflection point right now. And I think in the United States, we have to ask ourselves, and then this is a valid question we should always ask ourselves when we vote. If I'm voting for a Republican party member or a Democratic party, what does it mean to be a Republican? What does it mean to be a Democrat? And who I'm voting for, why am I voting for them? You know, what, what values do I ascribe in this and casting this vote? I think right now, I think the as an example, the Democratic party um, needs to be a party that that re reimagines how it talks about faith, that reimagines how it talks about business. You know, there is rhetoric that says Democrats demonize successful entrepreneurship. And so they need to reimagine that conversation and then have a policy framework, which I've supported and, and helped craft policy framework to do these things, but to, to have a policy framework that supports entrepreneurship, that supports um, helping to pick my brother up when they, when my brother has fallen and, and, and doing such a way that you're not having them be dependent upon you as a federal government, but teaching you such that you could be self-sufficient. So it's about a policy framework and a messaging that needs to change. And I think I think the the benefit of our, our, our current politics that is forcing us to re-examine re that. And I think that's a good thing. So you continue to look for the good in every circumstance. You, you're, you're finding the good in this moment. Absolutely. I, I have been through personally a, 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 
a lot of, of rough situations. I shouldn't be where I am to, to, today, but it's because beyond my, my faith in God, I just have a faith that God has a plan in me. And that's another, there's two parts to it. You can believe in God. You can have a belief, but you also need to remember God believes in you. Even, oh. when, you know, even, even when you're not perfect, even when you have fallen, God, I, I'm, every person, I don't care where you are in this world, what you've done, what mistakes you've made, I sincerely believe God believes in you. And so with that faith, even in my own mistakes and God's grace, I believe even that, you know, say folks who don't like the current president or didn't like a certain political party outcome, you're not limited to what you can do in life. I believe there's good to be found in every. I found even, um, you know, though I'm democratically leaning, um, I found opportunities to partner with my Republican brother, brethren who worked in this past administration and we got along fantastic. And mm -hmm. so I found, I look, you have to look for the good to maybe, maybe to, to tweak what you said, Ms. Janice is, we have to be seeking and looking for the good. And I think if you're always looking for that, you will, you will find it. And then that's, if, if I want to dwell on the negative things and the, and the shortcomings of this and that, but more of that will increase in my life. I believe that. So I've found great ways to partner with this current admission or folks. Matter of fact, some of my recent business partners are, are more Republican or probably more. I probably have more recently more Republican leaning business partners ever in my life now as a, as a confluence of things. And so what we found value, we found good things that we agree on and that we can solve problems together. Well, you know, speaking of that, um, as we look at it, science is going to be incredible in helping us through this pandemic. Uh, whether we go to that science based from faith or not, one thing we do know is that we're going to have to create more scientists. And when we look at STEM, yes. science, technology, engineering, and math, What's your rally call that young people consider this now and um, across, across their ethnicities, gender, we need everybody in this, don't we? We, we don't have just this cold hard facts. We don't have enough white folks who dominate, you know, white males in particular who dominate the STEM field. We don't have enough of them to, to fulfill the needs of jobs, to fulfill the needs of, of, of businesses to be created, faculty positions to be filled, positions in, in um, whether in-, in You mean when we count population- Yes. It doesn't add up to enough people to fill the jobs. No. It doesn't uh -oh. add up whatsoever. And we, we and then another thing is that science, and this is one of the things I love about science and why all people at all, you know, races and creeds need to get involved in STEM and, and as a science is science is always contextualized by your personal experience. And sometimes people forget about that. Sometimes even when we talk about STEM, we 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 sometimes de we you know we dehuman it a bit, meaning uh, when I used to, when I taught um, at, at the university level or when I tutor folks in whether it's science, math or science, I always make an effort to contextualize it to them personally. If you can contextualize it personally, um, it will allow you to imagine solutions and strategies. So as an example, <clears throat> You know, some of the challenges that we faced in health, I'll give you an example that's really passionate to my heart. There's a lot of, of, of health care and, and uh, reproductive health issues in the African-American uh, women community. A lot of issues with reproductive health. Um, some of the challenges and why we don't see more research being done in that area is because we don't see more and more African American women becoming scientists about, uh, you know, biomedical engineers and, and physicians in these areas to do research in that. And so we need everyone to solve all these different problems that we have in, in terms of a contextual framework. Another opportunity, and this is probably one I talk about most about STEM, is We've done as a country a pretty good job about STEM education, not great, but okay job. Uh, the greatest opportunity is actually STEM entrepreneurship. We don't have enough folks who are trained in STEM who can also speak to languages of business and commerce, who can help translate that science into a language that a business person can do well with. That is by far the, the, the greatest opportunity for, for those who maybe don't want to 
spend their lifetime in the lab, they can have multiple career paths having a STEM foundation and can do very, very well. And so that's that's where my message is now. That's what the short, the shortest, the greatest opportunity is. Wow. You know, I'm loving hearing that because when I look at many of the people who we work with through my company um, uh, as candidates, as applicants, you know, over 70% of them have their own uh, websites and no, no company attached to it. But there's definitely the idea of branding in there mm-hmm. or, 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 or of their imprint. Right. On, on, on an outcome. So that, that's a big message. I think, I hope everybody's really listening to that and can, can think about it in, a, in an intentional way, not just ideologically. I, I may give some examples, and though these are white male examples, um, Elon Musk, who's in the news quite often, um, you know, his background is, is obviously STEM, but his passions is for business. And one of the things that I see for the African-American community specifically, we have done a decent job of encouraging for edu- er, encouraging education. And, you know, your, your example needs to be celebrated more that you took a, a passion for people and turned it into an amazing business. And so people don't understand that the greatest, and this is the, my, the greatest thing about knowledge is that if you can take your knowledge and apply it, especially in business, that, that, that's the greatest, one of the greatest things you can do. So Elon Musk has done, created a billion dollars worth of wealth doing that. And so I want to see Black folks and folks who have been disenfranchised own their knowledge, not only just their ability to work for someone, but own it in such a way that they can make money from their knowledge. And you know, uh, the great, uh, a, a great number of our family listening to you right now are young women, mm-hmm. women across all ethnicities. This is a huge uh, opportunity for women if we listen and then act on your ideas around STEM entrepreneurship for us to solve a lot of the other things that we look at. Yeah, it, it is. I so I, I my couple other hats I wear. You know, as a principal, I'm a principal scientist and. As mentioned from my bio, and I and I work um, on faculty at F. Florida International University. One of the things I do there, I run a program to incubate new technology and new ideas. And I've been doing this for the last couple of years. And what I have observed is that over two thirds of participants and applicants are women, and most of them are women of color. <laughs> and the thing I have observed from and just observing them is that. They're just obviously they're just as brilliant. Okay, there's plenty of uh, there's matter of fact one of my favorite points I, I raised with them is that women have shown to be better investors um, than men, um, more much more uh, successful at managing things. And so why not take that expertise if you can figure out a way to invest money and manage it superior to others? Why can't you apply that to running a STEM a STEM type of business? And so. I, I am very encouraged um, for the future. And I think the future is women of color and entrepreneurship. The stats are, are speaking to that in terms of education rates, um, the proclivity to entrepreneurship. And so that is very exciting. And so the things I run with, with my incubator program is that we teach them how to start a STEM, STEM-based um, business around intellectual properties and patents they can get from the government. And so once you start to demystify that, connected with their strengths and talents, I think the, the sky is the limit. So that's why I'm most excited about, even you know, as, as I have a, a young daughter and I want to see her one day um, be an amazing, whatever she wants to be, but I, but I think she'll be an amazing entrepreneur. But um, women of all ethnicities can apply, yes? All people, all, all folks, all, everyone, anyone can apply, absolutely. Not just women, everybody's. Everybody's, everyone's ever inclusive. So you're going to tell us how to do that right now? Yeah, so you can find out more information, um, M2M, M, M, the letter M, number two, letter M, dot F-I-U dot A-D-U, or tinyurl.com forward slash M2M Inc. 2021. And let them know JBH sent you. Hey, listen, Dr. Chris, you know when we talk, we can just talk forever, and I always leave so educated, so refreshed, um, so intentional. Um, let's have a little bit of fun before we 
leave each other today, okay? So you know I do four for four, right? Okay. So here we go. Uh, you're gonna give me four answers and tell me why they're your answer, each okay. of them. Okay. So each four questions, okay? Mm -hmm. First question, you get to invite any four people to dinner from mm. any point in history, mm. living or dead. Um, who's at your dinner table and why? Oh gosh, wow. All right, the first two people popped into my head. Uh, I want, this may sound silly in some respects, Jesus Christ, uh, the, the manifested one. Um, Martin Luther King um, Jr. Um, mm, Abraham Lincoln and Nelson Mandela. <laughs> wow. Okay. All right. Well, look, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be you're gonna feed them in your man cave, huh? No women at that table. I'm, I'm sorry. You may say speak to how I'm shaped, right? This is so. your dinner. This is your dinner. <laughs> hey, now you gotta say why each of them. Um, I have questions. So Jesus number one, I have questions for Jesus not in the Bible. So um, that can't be found in Bible, Dead Sea Scroll text. So I'm a, I'm a, you know, a student of the Bible and history. And I just have questions. Some things I imagine be answered in heaven, but things while here on earth, I would have some questions about. Um, why don't, why don't, why don't you share a couple of them if you're comfortable to? You never know. Maybe somebody can help your thinking on that. Well, well, there's some some questions like uh, there, when you read certain Bible. Well, so there's one so one question in particular. Um, there was a there's a passage of scripture when Jesus um, uh, man there was a, Jesus was up in the mountain and uh, the Holy Spirit descended and manifested Joshua Moses. I have just questions about that, just about the whole experience, the encounter. Um, I have questions about when he was between the ages of 12 and 30. What, where was he? What did he do? Um, what was his, what was Joseph like as a father? What was Mary like? It just, just some, the human, the human yeah. side. I have the things are not written and it's, it's a lot of mystery around that. Um, leading, leading folks as a leader. Um, how do you, you know, think about Jesus, this is not talked about about Jesus, but I think Jesus is an amazing leader. If you think about it, you know, to be able to captivate someone and to follow you with the message for the years and then to leave 12 men and, and, and probably other followers uh, with a message. I mean, just as a man, as a leader um, and then as dealing with things as, <clears throat> as a man. The Bible says he suffered in all ways as we suffer as men. And so I, I just have questions as a man, how do he deal with his different male suffering? So, so that's one, um, Jesus. Martin Luther King, um, he, I, was, I mentioned him earlier. Um, he is a central inspirational figure. Um, and maybe this is this is a great psychological evaluation of me, but just as you saw, my friends were men. But um, the I admire, question, well, why Martin Luther King? I would want to know um, just these. This another leader. This is a leadership question. Just around living, living your living a mission that costs you so much. And what's that like living like that? Um, and what was that like? I just I have questions. I have questions about leadership for him, um, and and the mission that he led, and how and how he balanced his faith with his humanity, with his mission, you know, and his family, all those things. Um, I would I would want to hear his discussion in context of what Jesus would say. Um, Abraham Lincoln, for a number of reasons, um, and he's a white male, obviously, um, but the, the, you know, he was, you know, a, a radical revolutionary, that, uh, very, um, um, a lot of faults, a lot of um, controversy that surrounds him in, mis in, in, in history and in mystery. And I would want to ask him about leading, leading people that he, you know, he picked his cabinet to be in conflict. And I think the way he led as a leader um, in conflict, I think we can learn a lot about that today. Uh, you know, he- Didn't he suffer from depression? Very much so, depression. Martha King as well. Mm -hmm. Martha King suffered from depression as well. Um, I would want to understand how he battled with his, his depression, melancholy. I think they called it back in those days. Yeah. Um, and 
I mean, just his humanity. We have, I mean, I've, I've had battles with depression in the past and those things and, and how it shaped them, you know, to do great things. Um, and then Nelson Mandela and, and, and why um, I would you know, been putting all these folks together. Maybe I to, to ask, to talk about why all them together. Um, again, as you said, the theme for me is leadership. Um, but Nelson, he overcame, I think once for a minute, he overcame institutionalized racism like no other leader has in history, to my knowledge. Maybe Abraham Lincoln to have an interesting conversation about that subject. And I would actually want to hear them talk about institutionalized racism. Nelson Mandela and Abraham Lincoln talk about that and talk about the compromises that Abraham had to make um, to keep the union together um, and in light of institutionalized racism and then things that Nelson had to do to fight institutionalized racism and to lead um, folks who had competing um, values and interest in that. And so um, those things and, and why all them all together, um, I, I think some of the greatest things we can do as humans is to learn how to be a, a better leader. Um, for me as a man, those are things, those are men who I historically look up to and, and take take a measure from and, and, and who um, I hope to leave a legacy that would bring them, you know, make them proud. <laughs> and so those, those things, um, yeah, as those are things are really leadership and, and servitude are things that are in, in genuinely, genuinely passionate in my heart. Wow. I, well, you know what? I have to give you five people at that dinner because I want to come. I want to hear some of those <laughs> that conversation too. And if you're invited, yes, you're invited. <laughs> Listen, uh, Dr. Chris, we're going to go two for four, okay? okay. And um, tell us that I really. I'm opening the door now talking to a scientist. Tell us what you're reading right now. What four books are you reading oh. and um, what you recommend to us to read? Mm. Okay. All right. Well, I hate to say it this way. The Bible I'm reading uh, right now, but I'm going to tell you why. Um, okay. So, um, you know, you should, if not daily, you should have a weekly basis to be filling yourself with Holy Scripture. And, and that wisdom and the holiness of that word, it keeps me grounded. Um, it keeps me, um, you know, and one th I'll maybe get a little more specific. I'm reading right now in the book of Genesis, even, even deeper and reading things about the mystery of, 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 of humanity in terms of how we work together as husband and wife and being a father and all those things. And, and what does that mean to me? What are the wisdoms of that? Um, <clears throat> so that's one. Um, I'm reading this book, and I have to pull up the name. It's a new book. Um, it's on my phone. Um, it's there was a study done by um, the Atlanta. It's now called the Atlanta Business League, but it's a book written that um, studies African at, at the turn of the 20th century. Um, mm -hmm. It was a study done on black businesses. It's a fascinating book. So. Um, uh, W.E.D. Du Bois was a part of it. It was an amazing list of folks who put together this chronicle of the state of Black business at the turn of the 20th century. So fascinating. Um, and, uh, it's a, really a report on it, and it's a fascinating read uh, right now. Um, I'm thoroughly, thoroughly enjoying it. Um, a couple other books that the four, I guess the four most recent probably things that I'm reading uh, this may sound silly because I'm a parent, um, but I'm reading a, ch a children's um, book uh, Bible to my daughter. <laughs> and so, uh, why I, I bring I bring that up is it's important to you know whatever your faith is. I think it's one of the best things you can share with your children and your family is faith. And so um, we, if not daily, but you know frequently, we go through um, a children's Bible together, and she's able to articulate her faith better. So I, as a as a father, that that makes me most excited. Um, and then probably the last one I'll share that I'm I'm reading. Um, there's a, a book that talks about, and I'm sorry, I'm bad with names. I just know, I just remember the information. Um, I'm studying right now um, new economies, and so it's it's a study of, and I, it's, I don't have it on this office with me right now. I'm looking to see if it's not here, some other. Um, 
it looks at is written by MIT professors um, who have who are analyzing um, the new economy. What does it mean with tech, the confluence of technology? And I'll have to maybe I'll send you a link and you can add us to, to this later. But it's the confluence of technology and what it means for um, emerging economies and what it means to the workforce, what it means to business, what it means to income. It's a fascinating read of artificial intelligence, robotics, the confluence of what it means for governments. It's a fascinating read on, <clears throat> on how we need to reimagine our economies, how we need to imagine work, how we need to reimagine business. So the Negro in Business Volume Four. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. So are these four books also books you recommend to our family to read? I'll tell you, if, I'm, if I can find the other one. So I actually, for, for those who are African-American, it's interesting. Um, I will say this. Um, the book on the Negro in business, for those who especially who are African-American business, or any, for anyone for that matter, if you want to understand um what was it like and the types of businesses that black folks were doing at the turn of the 20th century? And to and, and so think of it this way to look at, and this is important why you should read it. Contextualize what types of businesses you're doing now as a part of helping to build a nation, to build a country. And so that's where if you look at in, in reading this, this book, it, it shows how blacks were limited maybe for various reasons, obviously, in the types of businesses they're started. So as you read this, you should ask yourself the same question. Is the, is the business that I'm doing, why am I doing this business or why am I considering this business? And is this the best business that can be best, most profitable for my skill sets, my network, and those who I can be in business with? So that is a... Go ahead. You, you know, Dr. Chris, so many of my friends are white and want to uh, be educated and informed and engaged in the lives and the, the opportunities and the struggles of their black friends. And so I'm really glad that you recommend it for everybody to read because I think it'll put some context to where their black friends are now for our white friends to read these books too. It's it's not discussed well enough because you know we and, and I can share there's stats to discuss this but there's we don't have a discussion on why black folks are having certain outcomes in business and oftentimes it's not access to right partnerships maybe you need to partner with your white brother and sister your, your Latino brother and sister um, to start to to maximize your skill sets and and that's where we're not. Um, some of the limitations of black owned companies is that not having the right partnerships. And this is yeah, where we know that we bring value when we work and when we partner with uh, whites, the, 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 the reverse can be true as well. Exactly. Exactly. What are you listening to? What, 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 for, tell us for you're listening to and why. I, I'll tell you because, um, let's see, I got a new playlist. Um, of my favorite songs from 2020. <laughs> and so I love I love R&B and, and hip hop, of course, gospel music. But for those who want to see a different flavor of what, um, so I got them listed. And now that I expect you to ask me this question, but I just have my list here. <laughs> and so <laughs> um, I'm just my Apple Music playlist, my new faves. And this is also my family. We love these songs. So Trenches by Monica and Neptunes. Um, oh, gosh, uh, this song comes on. We go crazy. My house, Yummy by Justin Bieber. <laughs> um, Loyal, Party Next Door uh, featuring Drake. And then um, this is... I don't care, Ed Sharon and, and Justin Bieber. So that's what oh, I'm Oh, Ed Sharon, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I used to cry to his song, uh, uh, the uh, one, Will You Love Me When I'm 70. Oh my God, I used uh, to cry to that song. Uh, uh, okay, how old are your kids? My daughter is three going on 30, so yes. Oh, okay, <laughs> yummy, baby. Uh, <laughs> um, and then last question, Dr. Chris, and I hate to come to the last question because it comes to the finish of this conversation, but we'll have so many more. Um, advice, you're gonna do two things. You're gonna give us the four pieces of best advice you ever received. Mm -hmm. And then would you please let us know what four pieces of advice you give to our family right now? Wow. wow. Um... 
four pieces of advice I, I've received and what I would give. Um, number one, I'm just thinking maybe chronologically, my, my mother's first piece of advice, one of the biggest things she's taught me um, is to never give up, to never quit, um, no matter the circumstances, to never quit. Um, number one. Number two, to own your knowledge. To own your knowledge from my father. To own your knowledge. Uh, own your knowledge. Um, uh, number three, never allow someone else to define your value. Never allow someone else to define. There was multiple friends who have said that to me in different ways, but the, the takeaway is never allow someone to define someone else to define your value. Um, number four, it's not about you. <laughs> um, and I, yeah, I've got this from multiple people, but, from, <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's not about you. Um, and meaning we should always think. Think about others, not think less of self, but think of others. We should always think of others. Um, advice I will give to four pieces of advice I will give to other people. Um, number one is to love yourself no matter what. Love people no matter what. Uh, and, and those are in the same same scenarios, uh, same within the same vein. Love yourself and love people no matter what. Uh, number two, never stop dreaming and believing it's one of the i could talk about how i see people who stop dreaming and believing and, and stop imagining and hoping it's just it's a sad wow. place never stop dreaming never stop believing work hard and work smart be ready to work hard but if all if it at all means work smart um you you only can control what you can control your time. So work hard and work smart. Um, lastly, it, success never comes alone. It always come in teams. Be, always be focused on you know, evaluating your team, who's on your team, uh, whose team are you on, and how can you be a better team member, uh, whatever, whatever you're doing in life. Teamwork, wow. so, teamwork makes a difference. That is really incredible advice right now, especially when all of us have to be on the same team because all of us are solving for the same solution together. Absolutely. That is incredible. Well, I don't know if there's anything else you want to talk about or share in this moment. You've certainly been incredible uh, in this conversation. Well, you want to share. I just want to say thank you for having me, how much I love you and appreciate you and all you stand for and your family, how much you've been a, a blessing, inspiration to me. And all those things I've said, you probably have said to me in a different way. So uh, <laughs> all those points of wisdom. No, thank you. And just love you and your family and love our, our my new family that you are affectionately family here. And uh, I just also want, you know, just keep everyone to stay positive, start to keep believing and stay hopeful even in this time. Wow, Dr. Chris, it is such, such a blessing to enjoy your company in this way. And I'm sending a lot of love and prayers for health and happiness and prosperity from my heart to your home. Thank you. Thank you. And likewise. God bless. God bless. Thank you.